Ealing's comedies are, are absolutely remarkable and incredibly funny. They are supercharged with comic and dramatic intelligence. Defined British comedy for a generation. They're the very best of, the, of British creativity. Kind Hearts and Coronets, for those who haven't seen it, is a movie that creeps up on you. It has this tone of wonderful irony and humour and distance. Mind-blowingly ahead of its time and misanthropic and yet at the same time uh, heartwarming and wonderful. The quality of the dialogue is of a different is of a different order of being. It's just a delightful, perfect comic performance throughout the hundred minutes of the film. Obviously, Ealing runs in its blood. What's amazing about Ealing is it's a tiny site. The sort of the big American studios have dozens of enormous sound stages. Ealing has about two and a half. And literally the sets had to be quite small. It forced them onto location. All of those films we think of as the Ealing films are really the work of a handful of, of these great directors who whose credit was perhaps lost behind that amazing garlanded Ealing logo. I think they left an incredible legacy for a really comparatively short period of time but i and and, and the, the way they operated reading each other's scripts and watching each other's cuts and watching each other's rushes and offering advice and sort of swapping things around can really only work in that sort of small studio system which doesn't quite exist today diana morgan who was one of the few female writers who was writing at this time with, um, with the healing collective once said that um she got credits for films that she had hardly done any work on and didn't get credits on films where she'd actually rewritten the entire script because they all worked in each other's films. All of the crew and, and, and all of the writers and all of the directors were contracted year round. So you have the same costume designers, you have the same set builders, you have the same, you know, writers and directors all uh, influence each other and inspiring each other and, and pushing each other to greater and greater heights. I have in the last a couple of last decade or so have an even finer appreciation of what Ealing did because of the films they made during the Second World War. Um, they adopted a style that was a combination of uh, documentary and um, narrative. It was a sort of fictionalised documentary which they really instituted during the Second World War when they were trying to get people to uh, enjoy films and understand there was a propaganda message behind them and so with films like Went the Day Well and The Former Went to France they would have common comedians like Tommy Trinder and other comedians, successful comedians at the time in those movies but they would actually be real live dramas and films that people could relate to so after the war they continued in that style and Hue and Cry which was set on the bomb sites of London was one of the films that really did embrace shooting on location in real places and real with real stories and real characters but with a great yarn at the basis of it. Operation Seagull. Okay, it's worked, come on! They carried on in that vein, making films for the people, about the people, which sounds a bit patronising, but they were um, precursors very much to the kind of Ken Loach, Mike Lee style that came, that became popular in the 70s, 80s and now, um, where they took um, dramas that were from the newspapers or from stories or from books that were um, written about and by everyday people. On the drama side they made films like Blue Lamp which was a hugely successful film and very unknown for the fact that it, it used an awful lot of location shooting and again was a uh, quite hard hitting for its time. And then films like Lady Killers where they were shooting King's Cross and they were um, almost very dark. Ealing comedies came sort of almost by default to uh, define the British sense of humour, certainly that sort of post-war sense of humour, because they had great success in America, and so it became a sort of British export of comedy. The whole idea of Ealing comedies comes from a period in 1949 
when by happenstance three films that were similar in terms of being, being comic and sort of done the same way came out, Whiskey Galore, um, Passport to Pimlico, and um, Kind Hearts and Coronets. They really set the style of what is known as kind of as an Ealing movie, a sort of Ealing comedy, but until then Ealing had made lots of different films in lots of different styles, and this really sort of became their house style at the time. Was Lord Tennyson far from the mark when he wrote, kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood? I saw Kind Hearts and Coronets first as a child on TV and I must have been about seven or eight years old and you know a black and white film from the 1940s wasn't the sort of thing that sets your heart on fire and makes you very enthusiastic to kind of get up in the morning and watch but my dad told me it was a, a masterpiece and uh, for the first and last time he was absolutely right. This news threw me into such distress of mind that had I had poison in my possession I would probably have administered it to Ethelred there and then and chanced the consequent inquiries. The main uh, impression it made on me was that it was incredibly funny and coming back to it, you know, uh, decades later, it is still just wickedly funny. The script is incredibly tight. Every line seems perfectly sort of crafted as a, as a sort of joke. Um, but it also takes you on this incredible moral journey. And as a sort of child watching that, I was kind of amazed that the, the, the villain, you know, this sort of murderous villain was the hero. But what could I do to hurt them? What could I take from them? Except perhaps their lives. The book itself is called Israel Rank by uh, uh, an actor manager, not particularly well known as an author, but an actor manager called Roy Horniman. And until very recently, the book was out of print and nobody really knew anything about the book at all. It was in fact uh, revived by the single-handed efforts of the uh, journalist Simon Heffer, who's another great fan of the film. The book is a satire on upwardly mobile people and a satire on the British class system and it's also a satire in its uh, in its indirect and rather feline way on racism and race in British society. But there is an important difference, a key difference between the book and the film. In the film the hero, if I can call him that, the anti-hero played by Dennis Price is of Italian or Anglo-Italian ancestry. In the book He's of Jewish ancestry. And so it is at least partly a satire on anti-Semitism. But I think it's fair to say that both John Dighton and Robert Hamer thought that the satire was of perhaps a slightly ambiguous sort. The name Israel Rank was a little bit heavy handed, although it's clearly a, a, a satire in some sense of upwardly mobile Jewish people. And I think it may have had in mind particularly Benjamin Disraeli. Um, but I think they thought that in, the, that in keeping the Jewish character, it may look possibly in slightly bad taste uh, and it might be too ambiguous for its own good and perhaps even be considered to participate in precisely that anti-Semitism which it was supposed to be attacking. So I think that uh, Dighton and Robert Hamer, and possibly and also Nancy Mitford, who is an uncredited script person on this film, thought that it would be slightly wrong, particularly just after the war, and that was somewhere they didn't want to go, and that in any case, the satire worked perfectly well as an, it as an Italian. Perhaps I should begin at the beginning. I was a healthy baby, born of an English mother and Italian father. Who succumbed to a heart attack at the moment of first setting eyes on me. If you read the book having seen the film, you can hear Dennis Price's voice reading out the book in your head. It captures the tone very well, but it immeasurably improves in terms of plot ingenuity and plot impact, particularly with the reveal at the end of how exactly the police are brought in. And I think that's a, a, a terrific improvement that, 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 that uh, Dighton and Hamer made. Sprocket's farm. No, Your Grace. From Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard. A matter of some delicacy. Follow me, please. The blow was so sudden that I found it hard to collect my thoughts. We 
which of them could it be? The dialogue in Kind Hearts and Coronets is, uh, to use that terrible expression, razor sharp. I mean, there really is not a wasted word. It's incredibly spare. It's incredibly precise. And every line feels like a brilliant, uh, perfectly phrased put down. Oh, Lord, I don't want to marry Lyle. Why not? He's so down. I must admit, he exhibits the most extraordinary capacity for middle age that I've ever encountered in a young man of 24. It's all just incredibly withering and scornful and, and, and brilliant. And I really don't think writing like that comes along very often at all. It's a, a great pleasure to watch and it feels just as fast and fresh and funny today as it did then. And how is Italy? Oh, impossible. Every time I wanted to go shopping, Lionel dragged me off to a church or picture gallery. He said he wanted to improve his mind. He has room to do so. I should reprove you for saying unkind things about him. It's one of the few films I can think of that was made in the late 40s, around the world, not just in the UK, that actually has the main character is slowly but surely murdering people. <laughs> during the weekend already undergone a fate worse than death. The whole of the sort of first act sets uh, just really gets you on his side because the sort of family is so relentlessly snobbish and relentlessly cruel and they you know they not only do they sort of turn his mother out of the house they they they, they and out of the family they kind of resist all her attempts at rapprochement after his father's death they won't even let her be buried in the family vault they forget who he is they won't give him a situation they kind of relentlessly snobbish until you you like louis really begin to kind of hope that a lot of them get wiped out madam I am instructed by Lord Ascoin Dascoin to inform you that he is not aware of your son's existence as a member of the Dascoin family. Signed by his secretary. It's very stupid of him, of them all, not to admit your existence when one day you might be Duke of Chalfont. It's a very big night, Mama. There must be at least twelve people before me, to say nothing of the ones who haven't been born yet. Stranger things have happened. I don't wish to be unchristian, but... In view of that attitude, I could almost wish those 12 people should all die tomorrow. By the time you reach the end of the film, I, I, I find anyway, maybe it's a terrible indictment on my personality that I, I'm desperate for him to get away with it. The attitude taken by this film to class system is very ambiguous. Obviously, it is a deeply subversive film. It's a film about killing all those rich, arrogant, horrible people that were such snobs. And it's a film which just absolutely grabs snobbery by the throat uh, and wants to punish snobbery. But it's also fair to say that this isn't a socialist film. It's the Louis Mazzini, he wants to be the Duke. That's what he wants his birthright. He doesn't want everybody, he doesn't want the, 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 the class system to be abolished. He thinks fine, but he thinks that the people at the top have injured their responsibilities on the noblesse oblige front, particularly as it pertains to him. And he wants to rise up the ranks and be the Duke. Reduced to even deeper poverty by my father's death, Mama swallowed her pride and made an effort at reconciliation with her family. They did not even reply to her letter. In order to keep us both alive, she was reduced to the horrible expedient of taking in a lodger. <laughs> To him, she had to perform the most menial tasks. She felt that her family had conspired to cheat me of my birthright. And I passed from infancy to childhood in an atmosphere of family history and genealogies. So it's an interestingly ambiguous approach to class, but it's a brilliantly kind of challenging and confrontational approach in that it shows the arrogance and the unpleasantness, particularly with the old Duke, uh, at the funeral scene, who uh, couldn't be more, couldn't be more dismissive, couldn't be more heartless, couldn't be more insensitive about Louis's ex, uh, Louis's uh, late mother, in the way that she wanted to be buried in in the family in the family vault. 
glad we had Cousin Henry to take the service. Boring old ass, but it keeps the thing in the family. People getting strange ideas these days. Had a fellow write to me not so long ago, wanted to bury his mother here from Tootin or somewhere. Start letting strangers in, the place will be full up. No room for us, eh? I privately promised him that I would make it my business to see there was room for him. It's about the, the awful pain that you can experience, in a way, as a member of the middle class. Not the member of the lower classes, the middle classes. That's what's so brilliant. You, you can wince because you are aspirational. You think you deserve it, and yet you feel it like a paper cut when somebody's snobber, snobbish towards you. When uh, Sibella says to Louis, who ever heard of a duke blacking the lodger's boots? And he feels it so intensely, that, that pain, that mortification, that humiliation. We've heard of a gentleman blacking the lodger's boots. That's a wicked thing to say, just because Mama was poor. Lionel will be very rich one day. I might be a duke one day. Pigs might fly. And so that's what the class satire in Kind Hearts is about, the awful pain of being a person in the, in the suburbs, the uncool, unfashionable suburbs of southwest London, and having to work all oh, the humiliation of it in a, in a gentleman's outfitters and having to work in sort of ladies smalls and things like that and when a very grand person like the young uh, Dascoin comes in and um, is furious that the man appears to be overhearing his conversation and he says to him hey hey don't listen to what we are saying and pokes him in the chest with his cane and whenever I see that film I feel that poke in my chest I can imagine what that's like I've worked in a shop once when I was uh, Louis age and I can hear and feel the snobbery and the unpleasantness of the of the clientele in 1949, when they made this film, people were people in London, in particular, were suffering just as badly as they were when the war was raging in in, in the early 40s. In fact, one could probably make a good argument to say things were better in 1939 than they were in 1949, because people weren't there wasn't housing. There was a lot of problems in the UK, and people were very disillusioned with how the class system had gone back to where it was the nation realised that nothing really much had changed. And that cynicism is something that um, people carried through the 50s and was only really dispelled again in the 60s when there seemed to be new hope and a new way forward and, you know, they had a, a Labour government in 1964 and Harold Wilson and things were going to change. But really through the late 40s and early 50s, um, Ealing reflected people's uh, disenchantment with what was going on politically in society. And no film, I think, ever did that more than the Kind Hearts and Coronets. Life presents us with all these problems, all these situations that are really painful. Um, so I think people, you know, were hurt by um, the, the class system, both the people within it and the people without it. And I think if you can kind of really deal with something, you're really dealing with it, but you're kind of making it into something better and taking the sting out of it in a good way. And that's what this, this film does. Time had brought me revenge on Lano. And as the Italian proverb says, revenge is a dish which people of taste prefer to eat cold. There's sort of three things I think that are great about casting Alec Guinness in all these roles. Firstly, you get eight times as much Alec Guinness as you would otherwise get, which can only be a good thing. The second is that because he plays all of the Dascoins, every time he's kind of murdered in a sort of increasingly ridiculous way, like being blown up in his uh, potting shed or sort of drowned at sea or, or poisoned, you don't really feel that he's died because Alec Guinness is going to be in the next scene. So it kind of makes you feel it sort of takes away all the kind of the uh, bitterness of his death or kind of feeling because you sort of go, well, he's not, he's not really dead. It's kind of like he's just stopped pretending to be one person and popped up as somebody else. What do you think of Maud? A uh, charming girl. Though perhaps at times her conversation is a little uh, lacking in sparkle. Dullest woman I've ever met in my life. Plain, too. But good breeding stock. According to the story, he was sent the script and proposed four roles, and he stopped 
reading it to send a telegram immediately. I want to do this, but why just four roles? Why not eight? And ultimately, they had him in a portrait, too. So he represents nine members of the uh, Dascoigne family. You start to sort of meet some Alec Guinness figures who sort of seem quite nice. And, and, and I find, found myself watching it recently that you sort of go, oh, it sort of, it sort of tricks you as an audience member because you go, oh, OK, I can see I've been, this guy's been set on the path to revenge, but he's going to meet some nice ones and he's going to kind of have a, a moral dilemma as to what to do. But he doesn't at all. <laughs> he just kind of blindly keeps on wiping them out. It's perhaps not his far and away greatest achievement, although it is one of his achievements. He was absolutely brilliant to have created eight or nine characters, all of whom differentiated. It's not just a pantomime turn where the joke is that he's always himself, not at all. You can watch this film and quite easily forget that they are different characters, quite easily. I never watch this film and I've watched it over and over again and thinking, oh yeah, here we go again, Alec Guinness doing a sort of knockabout panto turn as himself, not at all. It sort of takes it out of the realm of reality, which is a great thing for something so dark. So you don't sort of go full kind of Fargo or something where you just feel like this is a bloodbath. It kind of keeps in a sort of slightly heightened, almost theatrical sense and just let you enjoy the mechanics of the plot in a kind of very farcical way rather than feeling too deeply for each of the, the victims, which is a great sort of twist and one of Michael Balcon, the producer's great ideas for the movie. Used to get a lot of this stuff in the Crimea. One thing the Ruskies do really well. One of the ways in which Kind Hearts and Coronets massively influenced Paddington 2 is the character of Phoenix Buchanan. We had this great uh, picture of Alec Guinness. There's a sort of publicity still from the time of him in these eight different costumes all on one sheet of paper. It was one of the main ways we attracted Hugh Grant to the role was sort of saying, I, I really wanted to use a character who could you know, have a performance where somebody dresses up as all these different characters. So it's such a pleasure to watch on screen. It's such a fun thing to play. And it, it always seemed to me a great way of doing a villain. Uh, Obviously, Alec Guinness is playing different characters and, and Hugh and Phoenix Buchanan and Paddington is, is playing uh, one character who dresses up in different things, but it was a, a huge inspiration for us. And, uh, and I'm sure, hopefully, part of the bait that we, we put on the hook to reel him in to come and be part of that movie. And the other great thing that I think it does is it sort of has this amazing sort of subtext of sort of saying these people are all, they all look different. They've all sort of got different garbs on, but they're all deep down these kind of evil, snobbish, hellish family. And they would sort of pop up like weeds. And so you kind of, you sort of want uh, Louis to keep going for them like a sort of whack-a-mole until he gets them all. Well, everyone talks about the Alec Guinness performances, which are marvelous. Um... But I think a lot of people now are talking about the Dennis Price performance, the main uh, Louis Mazzini character, who is this controlled performance. He's also the narration, so he's sort of permeate, the performance permeates the film. And that it's so elegant and restrained and, and ironic and funny. My good man, it is not by my choice that you keep me company. If you wish to sleep, pray to him with the courtesy of sleeping quietly. Dennis Price is somehow overlooked. He sort of plays two or three different roles himself. He plays his father and then he sort of plays himself in disguise. So it's not a kind of shabby one note performance. And I really think he anchors the whole thing. He has this extraordinary kind of voiceover, which again was very unusual for the time for how kind of how across the whole movie it is. Obviously films like Double Indemnity had used it a lot, but this, this really sort of drove it all the way through and was apparently one of the influences for the voiceover in Goodfellas when Martin Scorsese came to want this kind of criminal anti-hero. And it's a great way of having you sort of see the world through their eyes. It would have delighted me to refuse him. However, a bankrupt Lionel could hardly have continued to support Sibella in her extravagancies, and I had no wish to do so myself. He really has to carry the movie because we all talk about Alec Guinness, and of course we always want to talk about Alec Guinness because it was not just this movie, but all the other incredible films he made. So this film is known for what he did, but I think really is poor Dennis Price has to really shoulder it because he has to match him in every scene. And I think what's extraordinary about this movie is that he does. There's one scene where he's angry, Dennis Price, and he, he punches the man who has been his bete noir through the film, the man who has taken his true love, Sibylla, from him through his 
riches and his class status. It's the only time in the film where you see real anger and the only time in the film where you see real vengeance is when he murders point blank with a shotgun the nastiest of the the Dascoin family and he actually shoots him point blank. All the other murders are a little bit more subtle. It's clear that you are insane. Give me that gun at once. No. From here, I think the wound should look consistent with the story that I shall tell. It's slightly melancholy in a way because this was his masterpiece. He was never as good before and he wasn't ever quite as good ever again. Then you've also got Joan Greenwood, who's probably the my favourite actress of the of the nineteen forties, with this extraordinary kind of husky, silken voice. But what she does in the film is, as well as kind of being the love interest, she she turns in a, in a delicious way. She's kind of the object of Louis's affection, and and uh, he he's sort of desperate to win her heart until he starts going up the social ladder and it's another of the great twists of the film that you sort of go oh surely you know you, you sort of want to root for your hero but actually he turns into just the same sort of brutish snob as all the people he's wiping out as soon as as soon as he sort of discovers that he could perhaps uh, fall in love with a, a, a proper lady he starts to see her as terribly sort of bourgeois and middle class and you know living on the wrong side of the park which is sort of the greatest crime of her husband and uh, and sort of starts to use her but of course she's made of the same stuff as him and so there's this beautiful kind of uh, b-plot of, of their battle which kind of turns out to really drive the end of the movie. Lionel is still in love with me. My happiness is all he cares about. He might do the gentlemanly thing and let me divorce him. If? If I were in a position to explain to him that otherwise he would be jeopardizing the social position not only of the future Duke, but also of the future Duchess of Chalfont. I see. It's true that she gives as good as she gets and she really goes toe to toe with these characters, not only in the comic states, but in the kind of uh, dark side of things as well. And she's just wonderful. I was only thinking that question you asked at the trial about Lyon leaving a suicide note. Suppose he did. Suppose that one were found, even now, this last evening. It would save her of a miracle. Miracles can happen. Miracles could happen. Without her, despite the brilliance of the male actors, without Joan Greenwood and without, of course, Valerie Hobson, it wouldn't be at all the movie it is. And it's because she is so sexy and cynical and predatory there is something absolutely brilliant about it because uh, she sort of meets her match in a way with Louis and her poor treatment of him is is the spur to him to to get on to achieve his uh, multi-murderous plans in a way well when you are you you just come and show me your crown or whatever it's called and then I'll feel awfully silly won't I yes you will and I'm going to marry Lyon and I'm going to bed you will. <laughs> if there was a precise moment at which my insubstantial dreaming took on solid purpose, that was it. The desk coins are not only wrong, my mother, they were the obstacle between me and all that I wanted. Louis's greatest and cruelest and most sadistic moment in the film comes when he saunters back into the room that used to be their old nursery. Uh, and again, sauntering. Nobody ever sauntered quite as lightly or as elegantly as Dennis Price. Do actors saunter anymore? I don't know. He saunters in to find Sibella waltzing by herself around the room. Hello, Louis. You look very pleased with yourself. So do you. I have news. Oh, so have I. What is it? No, yours first. Lionel and I fixed a date for our wedding in two months time my congratulations no i should congratulate him i compliment you now yours nothing as exciting as yours i went today to see lord ascon dasco and my cousin you know. he has a private banking house in the city 
He offered me employment at once at five pounds a week with excellent prospects of promotion. And Hamer offers us a brilliant hard cut in close-up to Joan Greenwood's face, which is a mask of suppressed rage and humiliation because, of course, she understands very well indeed that this isn't small news, this isn't minor news. This is an amazing victory for Louis, an amazing victory over life, an amazing victory over his childhood, an amazing victory over the Dascoyne family, and an amazing victory over her, who had always jeered and sneered at his pretensions to aristocratic grandeur. And now she can see it's true. She never believed it, but it's true. And in a way, this, this minor scene is his greatest moment in the entire film. It's his greatest victory, greater than the scenes at the end where he appears to have entered into the ermine itself. This is an amazing scene, and it's done with such a stiletto touch by Hamer. It's absolutely brilliant. Robert Hamer had quite a tough time after Kind Hearts and Coronets. He sort of moved up the Ealing system. They, they tended to promote from within and he started as an editor and then moved up and made these three uh, increasingly brilliant films, uh, Pink String and Sealing Wax, and then the amazing It Always Rains on the Sunday, and then sort of hitting the pinnacle with Kind Hearts and Coronets. And, and life after that for him, I think, was a little tough. His next two projects were both rejected from Ealing and he ended up leaving. And it is a great tragedy because he truly was uh, a Michael Powell level genius who should be acknowledged along with the absolute greats of British cinema. And yet his name is really not known at all widely. Uh, and uh, somehow his work is just subsumed into the greater sense of Ealing. But what he did in those three films was uh, melodrama, beautiful, poetic, uh, social realism, and the blackest of black comedies, all within a very short space of time, completely different genres, all of them working triumphantly. And I just think he's an absolute master. Certainly Kind Hearts is his masterpiece. And in a way, there's nothing wrong with that. He made a film which is as I say, Hall of Fame level, this is one of the greatest films in the world, certainly in Britain and also the world. So I think it's a poignant and perhaps a tragic thing that he died without realising that. The strengths of this particular film of Kind Hearts and Coronets are the um, are so manifold. There are so many wonderful um, things about this film. The, the, the camera work alone Dougie Slocum's work is extraordinary. The way he managed to film those eight characters as if there were eight people in the room. There was no CGI in 1949, you know. There, if you wanted to shoot eight characters in a room, you'd have to lock the camera, shoot somebody, and then turn the camera off and go get the actor back in the clothes. In the case, the actor, of course, was Alec Guinness. Um, and then put them in, and then turn over again, and then lock the camera, and then get them back into cover. It was a long, slow process to shoot four or five actors, well, four or five characters in the rooms played by the same actor. To do that, and yet still to look as gorgeous and beautiful, and for the lighting to be as wonderful as it was, took real dedication. Apparently, Douglas Slocum slept in the church where you see all those actors appearing. Apparently he slept in the church. He was so worried that somebody might nudge the camera and all of his work would be undone because all the camera had to do was move by a centimetre and everything would have to be shot again. Um, and that kind of dedication is obvious when you see the film. It, it's technically a, a piece of wizardry. Another great thing about the movie is its costuming and the clothing that is worn by everybody, particularly Dennis Price's suits, which he wears those suits so well. It's, he always looks like a wonderful English gentleman. And that's the veteran costume designer, Anthony Mendelssohn. What I noticed watching it again was the skill with the costume design and the design of the film. So that you see Dennis Price as he's climbing the ladder to his natural inheritance. You see his costumes getting richer and silkier and more beautiful. But Sibylla's costumes also get more and more flamboyant. And every time she comes to visit him, her hats seem wider and larger and more cavalier. They're almost like something that Edith Head or Sandy Powell would design. They're more and more amusing and supposedly sexy and seductive, but they look 
pretty absurd. Um, and there's little touches like that that Robert Hamer brings to the film to show that it is a satire, that we are dealing with um, satirical characters, not at all in a reality, which allows him the ability to portray events that would otherwise be cruel or um, even deeply upsetting. It's one of the paradoxes, I think, that the legacy of Ealing Studios isn't really just, or even at all in film, because there aren't really many films which try to imitate an Ealing look. And when they do, they perhaps look a little bit jarring and out of time. I think the Ealing legacy is felt more generally in British culture, in a way. It's felt perhaps more in the theater, perhaps more in literature, in journalism and in the way we think about ourselves. It's a film of superlatives in my view. Um, it's exceptional. In fact, the, the, the director made that comment when he came to do the film. He said, there's been no film like this ever made. And one of the sort of instructions is that it should be permeated with the feeling of sort of Oscar Wilde. So it's more of a Wildean, Oscar Wildean film than the actual adaptations of Oscar Wilde's plays that we occasionally see. I'm afraid your memory is deceiving you. By no stretch of imagination could you and I be described as ever having been pals. If I remember correctly, we detested each other cordially from the first day we met, with a detestation which increased with our years. Always thought of you as a pal. Always have to. That's why I said to myself. It's only fair to warn you that any further expense of breath on this subject will be a waste. John Dyden himself was a great stage dramatist. He wrote The Happiest Days of Your Life, the great sort of schoolboy, schoolgirl comedy. He comes from a stage tradition and he understands the elegance uh, and the address to the audience that is demanded from a stage tradition. But that's not to say that it's stage bound or theatrical. It, it takes wings superbly as cinema. Some people have said that it's not truly an Ealing comedy because Ealing comedies are warm-hearted and, and giddy and, and, and all these things like that. But I think it is a, a very much an Ealing comedy, except this is the dark chocolate. This is the bitter, um, you know, fine palate um, morsel. And um, I, I think that I actually don't like black comedies. This is sort of the black comedy par excellence. But most I don't like because I think they go off into too much dark, too much sort of nasty, and sort of obvious nasty. And in this case, um, everything that is really appalling in, in the film, the appalling things that are happening, because there is murder, a lot of it, um, are kept in a sphere of sort of agreeable, happy unreality. And it's actually sort of a moral film in many ways. And um, I, I think it, it, it transcends all the things that could be negative. I shot an arrow in the air. She fell to earth in Barclay Square. It's an incredibly dark film and it gets away with its kind of uh, sort of relentlessly bleak worldview by being incredibly funny. And, and that's sort of what, what makes it work so brilliantly. All, all of the characters are, are evil to a greater or lesser extent. The Dascoins are horrible snobs. Louis, you root for, but becomes just as evil and flawed as they are. Uh, Sibella incites him to murder in the end and blackmail and is prepared to send a man to her death because she feels jilted. Uh, the only sort of quote unquote good character is Edith played by Valerie Hobson who is just hilariously dull she hates alcohol she is uh, prudish and boring and old fashioned and stuffy and so the film really doesn't paint a sort of good picture of anyone which is amazing for the time and a total joy in a, in a dark comedy I was uh, cycling through the village and felt compelled to stop and make a study or two of the inn it looked so charming it does look charming but I'm afraid it's by no means an influence for good in the lives of our people here. The landlord is a former coachman of ours. I have spoken to him several times about the amount of drinking that goes on there, but he continues to allow it. 
It is, after all, I suppose, his livelihood. I do not consider he has the right to make a livelihood by exploiting the weaknesses of his fellow men. In a way, it's a romantic view of crime, which is, here is something which I think I'm entitled to, and there are obstacles in my way, and I am going to destroy those obstacles or find an ingenious way around those obstacles in order for me to have what I want. Now, that's what it's about. It's also, I think, about careerism, particularly a male form of careerism. There are many people, men, in corporations and businesses all over the world who have a very low position and think they should be the CEO. And this film speaks to them. They need to rise up the ranks and it means killing people all the way. You can't rise through the ranks. You can't rise in life without annoying other people, to say the very least of it. You will also have to kill other people's careerist plans so that your careerist plans can be fulfilled. People who have risen to the top, however nice they are or appear to be, have had to do something pretty nasty along the way. And that's just the truth. When this film was released in America, they cut six minutes from it. And there's a crucial moment in this film, which is when he's released from prison. Because he is faced with two choices. And there is some evidence about the fact that he has committed these grotesque murders. Um, but that evidence is left undisturbed. And the film remains open-ended in a sense. There is, there is no conclusive punishment for our murdering hero. In America, they shot an ending where they uh, find the evidence because the Hays Code in America wouldn't allow that kind of subversion. There were some improvements with the production code strictures, but the um, ending put in the American um, version, I think it had too much finality. I represent the magazine Titbits, by whom I'm commissioned to approach you for the publication rights of your memoirs. A memoir? Uh, my memoir. My memoir. The other thing that they attacked as well, and something else which is incredibly um, uh, ahead of its time within the film, is the affair he's having with Sibella, who visits him uh, at his rooms in London. And it's so obvious that they're having an affair, it's almost not even coded. Um, and they talk about sex all the time. That's all they ever seem to talk about, even when they're young, younger versions of themselves, is sex. Um, and in America, they didn't like this at all. They chopped a lot of that conversation, that rather risque conversation they're always having about, I'll see you later, and she comes in, and then the lights fade, and it's, it's, it's all so obvious. Lionel's dining at home tonight. And where is Lionel dining tomorrow night? With some business acquaintances. And where are you dining tomorrow night? Here? Here. What makes Hind Hearts and Coronets a film for all time is uh, its extraordinary moral ambiguity, how it makes us root for the person that we know we shouldn't, but is funnier and wittier and cleverer than the people he's wiping out, and so we can't help but be on his side. It's a very macabre, brilliant, ice-cold black comedy. This shows how fine and controlled and sort of perfect a comedy can be. For me, it was a very inspirational film, and I think a film that um, I would demand any young filmmaker to watch. But what really makes it last is its extraordinary script, the thousands of one-liners that uh, pepper it, and the three great central performances, which could not be bettered. It's one of these films that just looks better and better and better as it, as it gets older. It's absolutely sublime.